about that today. I think there's another very interesting conversation to be had um, where we simply observe two, uh, two global trends. One is the changes taking place in China with regard to sustainable development. The second is changes in the corporate sector globally, also about sustainability. Um, with regard to the China case, um, you know, we all know that China is piloting a new course uh, in which it tries to raise the importance of environment, especially with regard to um, uh, the pace of economic growth. And China has come very clearly and said that they are willing to sacrifice growth points in order to have a better environmental outcome for the, the, the whole country. Um, <clears throat> and as a result of this, uh, China is alone undertaking a very wide ranging, um, uh, wide range of experiments in improving environmental management, ranging from emissions trading areas, environmental taxes, um, mandating, uh, you know, CSR and ESG reporting, um, upgrading their enforcement and regulations of the environment, and putting a lot of investment into um, new technologies to training um, the business sector and training its own officials on how to better manage the environment. Of course, all of these experiments, they'll take years to vest and um, probably years to be able to see the impact. But over time, this is one of the most far-reaching uh, programs that China has undertaken for um, in the course of its development. And what it's doing in Asia is actually it's creating a new paradigm for growth and competitiveness for developing nations. And if China actually succeeds, that will actually set an example for many, many developing countries which are encountering exactly the same problems. Um, it'll affect not only the services uh, sold, uh, the services and products bought and sold in China and traded, but also um, the whole concept of what does growth mean and what does development mean nationally. Now, briefly, in the corporate sector, we also see a lot of changes taking place with regard to companies beginning to take sustainability more seriously um, and especially embedding sustainability into their strategy and operations, not setting up a CSR department and publishing reports, but more really trying to see what are, um, what are the ways in which sustainability can actually help the company rethink um, how it operates and how it values uh, its performance. Um, as a result of this, uh, you know, the, a lot of the benchmarks that companies use for progress are also changing. Um, and for companies in Asia where the sort of sustainability tide has been a bit slower than in Europe and the US, a bit slower to take root, um, the multinational sort of striving towards sustainable, um, sustainable sustainability is actually, it's changing how we benchmark performance, it's changing how we look at where we invest, it's changing consumer expectations about what the role of companies should be in helping to solve uh, global environmental problems, and it's changing a lot of investor expectation, and I would, I would say that actually um, that investors, uh, not only multinational investors, but also private sector investors, regular, you know, mainstream fund managers, they're actually um, gathering environmental and social data um, about the companies that they invest in. And so the thesis here, um, the background of the session, is that these two trends, um, both China's changes and as well changes that are visible in the corporate sector, are actually causing um, uh, and should cause companies and nations to actually rethink how they view growth and competitiveness and how they benchmark their performance. So um, uh, FGI, uh, the Fung Global Institute, has actually done work on this, um, engaging a wide range of the Hong Kong business community, people who have nothing to do with sustainability in their day-to-day -day lives. Okay, this is how it's taking uh, impact. And, 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 and what the, the feedback we have received on it, and the project was specifically related to Hong Kong and will be um, available on our website very shortly, is um, it, it's that Hong Kong needs to actually uh, start to this process of rethinking as well, rethinking its competitiveness in the new framework in the context of changing regional and corporate expectations um, and performance. So, um, 
the, the session today is not only about Hong Kong, it's about all of Asia, and especially we've got two uh, very accomplished participants from China, uh, Mr. Zhang Yue, who is the CEO and founder of Broad Air Conditioning, which is one of the, um, which is probably the leading air conditioning um, and systems uh, companies in China. Uh, they're located in Changsha, um, but they basically manage a global footprint of air conditioning installations, and they are one of the, um, they're one of the foremost in trying to use uh, try to figure out how do you get more efficiency and how do you get more performance out of such such a basic system. Okay, in Asia we wouldn't be anywhere without air conditioning, right? Um, Mr. Zheng Xinye, who is uh, uh, from uh, Renmin University, who also has a dual appointment at Brookings. Uh, he, is, uh, he, he, he is also going to talk about what kind of systems, performance uh, metrics there, uh, uh, that are being employed in China in order to start to benchmark performance as we go ahead. Christine, uh, I think, I think you, you have one of the most diverse backgrounds of any, any, anyone probably in this entire conference. Uh, you've been a financial com a commodities trader, um, you've been in LegCo, you founded a think tank, and now you've gone over to the other side and you're going to be in government. <laughs> so we're, um, we're really fortunate to have Christine uh, uh, here. She's one of the uh, bright lights of the Hong Kong government. Um, and uh, so you're, you're, you're going to talk about basically the role of policy. Anita, um, you are with, uh, Anita George is with the IMF. She is uh, the head of regional infrastructure um, investment for South Asia or Asia Pacific. And um, also, uh, and as you know, IFC is one of the um, basically forerunners of um, sustainable investing um, in the world. So um, hope to learn a lot from you. Let me first turn the floor to Christine. Um, give a policy perspective on, on, on the issue. Uh, then we're going to hear from Anita, and then Mr. Zhang and Mr. Zhang. Okay, I think just a few points. Um, sorry, it's a bit torn, but I was asked to read this last night. <laughs> now, there are a couple of points in here, I think, that are interesting uh, relating to policy. For example, you say that um, a, lot of, you know, a lot of policies that are being implemented uh, or, or are still current policies all around the world, what people call yesterday's policies. So I think we all have the interest to really think about how governments, not just Hong Kong, but governments get advanced in our policies. Now, obviously, we are in China, and we, we have two colleagues uh, from the mainland. And one of the things that I've always been excited about, uh, but hotly debated with my mainland friends and colleagues, is how serious is the Chinese government. Um, I think let's just take air pollution, because air pollution is an issue uh, of uh, at crisis proportion in China. And for those of you who are living in Hong Kong, it's also, uh, although I would say that Hong Kong's air quality is probably the best amongst the big cities in China, but nevertheless, it is not good enough. So it's also a business issue here, because you've been talking about problems of uh, retention of talent and persuading people from outside Hong Kong to come to Hong Kong because of the poor air. Now, uh, I've been working personally in the air pollution area for, I think, nearly 20 years now. And of course, in the last year, uh, it's been particularly um, depressing because of the very poor air quality on the mainland, but also particularly perhaps heartening because of the much more aggressive policies that are coming forward. But I must say, it's a constant discussion, I think, amongst Chinese experts, whether we're doing enough, whether we're going fast enough, whether even with great policies that they can be implemented on the ground. But nevertheless, I think <coughs> we're not here to, to really, I mean, we, we do debate about that. But the truth, of course, is we want those policies to work. So the question that I have is whether the private sector, uh, in what areas can they contribute to expedite I think that's that. Would, you know, I think that's what we're all looking for. Now, I just uh, before I get into that subject, I, I just want to tell you about a couple of meetings that I've had. Now, I had a meeting just this morning um, with someone not unlike Chairman Zhang, another chairman of another mainland company uh, in waste management. And what the reason uh, we had breakfast was his question was, he says, "Well, we have all of this." Uh, quite good technology now from China, and we want to roll it out not only on the mainland, but in Hong Kong. You know, we, we want to see if we, if we in government could find Chinese technology useful. So I mean, the answer is obviously yes. Um, 
It's really how to also uh, uh, do more R&D in Hong Kong. I mean, R&D not in the going to the moon sense, but really application sense. How can we look at existing technology and how can they be applied, designed and applied locally? Um, now, the other meeting that I'm going to have quite soon is with emissions trading, and you mentioned this. Uh, sitting here in Hong Kong, and I think some of you in the audience uh, I've talked to before about emissions trading for carbon and perhaps other, even other pollutants uh, in the future. Somehow in Hong Kong, maybe we're just uh, not policy driven, obviously in, this, in these areas, but um, uh, maybe we make too much money from trading stocks and it's been extremely difficult to get people to focus on trading things that are not going to make any money for a long, long time. Nevertheless, because there is a policy push from the government, uh, our neighbors, both in uh, Guangdong and in Shenzhen, they've now started trading systems. And we've kept in touch with them. And my, my attitude, which is, I guess, also the gov Hong Kong's government attitude, therefore, uh, today, is let's look at what they're doing. We don't always have to have our own system. If they're doing something interesting, how can we collaborate with them? So one of the questions that one of these uh, uh, um, exchanges have had is whether we can work with them with, with, you know, with some help from the Hong Kong government that they will come here in the not too distant future to explain their system to companies here. Um, uh, not that perhaps Hong Kong companies would see fit to start trading straight away, but is there something whereby some of the Hong Kong companies would see it useful to join their exchange? And what would be the terms that would be interesting for them to do so? So, I mean, I find that kind of collaboration innovative and potentially interesting. Um, the last thing I want to say is uh, we've had a very good experience in Hong Kong with the Fairwinds Charter, and I know some of you have heard about that. Uh, Hong Kong will be the first city outside North America and Europe to implement uh, by legislation a fuel switching um, plan for ocean going vessels coming to Hong Kong from the 1st of January 2015. So what this means is all these big ships, you know, Maersk, OCL, China, China merchants, as, they, as their ships come to Hong Kong and berth in Hong Kong, they will be mandated to switch to a cleaner fuel. Now, what we're trying to do is to share the research that we've done of why we should do that, because it has very good public health benefits. We've shared our research with the Guangdong authorities, with the Shenzhen authorities, and with the Beijing government. Now, um, in China, they have not yet really um, got a policy for fuel switching for ships. Uh, their existing policies, it's about uh, onshore power. But that is going to take a long, long time before the terminals will, will have the equipment in place uh, for ships to tap in. Um, so what we are proposing, it's really uh, another policy because fuel switching can take place straight away. So in a little way, Hong Kong can, by taking some leadership, go first, work out what the legislation should look like. We've also got an incentive scheme for, for, for ships that are doing it. Our neighbors are asking us how that works because they're interested now to see whether that works. So again, some kind of regional collaboration, uh, I think it's, it's very good. But we wouldn't have been here. We, we wouldn't have gotten here so fast if the shipping industry didn't put their hand up and voluntarily said, let's go first. Let's try it. And that's why Hong Kong is legislating. Um, I really don't think that we would be doing it uh, if the trade hadn't put their hand up. So what are some of the other areas where businesses can, a, a sector of, of business can come together and say, let's do it? So can we imagine, uh, it hasn't happened yet, although I know we've talked about it, uh, can we imagine uh, a number of the property developers getting together and say, well, let's retrofit. When we're retrofitting our buildings, let's make it much more energy efficient. You know, let's have new boilers or let's have new air conditioning systems and so on. What if we did it all together? And we will tell the government that this is the level uh, that we can get to, and they should tighten their laws you know, so that we can take a bigger leap. I'll just give a final example. We are sort of doing something like this with food waste. Hong Kong throws away 3,600 tons of food waste a day. 
uh, of which a third comes from the commercial and industrial sector, but that means two-thirds come from you and me at home. Now, what we're trying to do is to work with the commercial sector, the restaurants uh, and the food producers, to see if um, they can reduce at source. Um, they have voluntarily said, you know, the people who've signed up, uh, they've voluntarily said they'll try and reduce um, food waste at source by about 10% over the course of, I guess, about three years. Now, if they can do that, actually, it's, it's quite tremendous. Uh, again, we're at the beginning of that. Um, they are also trying to share best practices, because obviously if there are best practices of how you run your kitchen, how you buy your food, and so on, that can be shared across the industry. That would be very useful. So I'd like to see plans like this um, uh, be becoming developed together between the government and the industry, and then propagated to the wider society. So I'll be looking for other ideas from you as to what are other areas where we can partner up. Thank you very much and thank you Pamela and the Fung Institute for inviting me as well as I'm really honored to be on this panel. Uh, Christine as always, I was hearing every word of what you're saying and thinking it's great this is what IFC has been doing, working with the private sector to really bring about change. So um, I remember looking back, the whole debate about growth and environment, whether it's a trade-off or not. And what IFC has been insisting since we took this up as a cause uh, from the, I would say, mid-1990s, is that it's really not a trade-off, particularly if you look at it from a time frame across generations. And uh, by insisting that it's not a trade-off, by ensuring that our environmental policies and standards are applied across every single transaction that we finance, and to date we've done $100 billion worth of financing, in emerging markets with the private sector, um, that has been a way in which to bring about small changes which have really in some sense grown into a movement. So as a young uh, investment or younger investment officer in IFC, I remember going to a lot of companies and being seen as the pains in the neck who had all these different uh, requirements which seemed very onerous. And uh, in fact, the first thing that people would tell us, uh, and usually you're talking to the CFO, they would say, what is all this going to cost us? And are you going to uh, shave your interest rate accordingly so that we can do these kinds of green things? And our response was that this is really a business risk. You're mitigating a business risk, so there's an inbuilt benefit by doing so. On the government side, as well as on the companies, the debate about uh, growth versus the environment has been one where we've often said you have to have growth to pull people out of poverty. And in Asia in particular, when we talk about China, South Korea, Singapore, we are often told that, you know, in the 60s, when people didn't have enough to eat, uh, it was a luxury to talk about uh, environment and, and sustainability. However, when you really think about it, uh, pollution of any form or sort, lack of clean water, lack of energy, um, is really affecting the poor the worst. So in some ways we've used uh, the poor to justify uh, growth without uh, really care for sustainability and environment. I have to say that even in my own lifetime, the change that we've seen at the country level, at individual firm level, as well as in terms of sectors, and I'm very happy to hear about what you're saying about the shipping industry, because just a few days ago, a large shipping company 
approached us to say that they see a huge business potential in green shipping technologies. And what they were putting forward to us is a proposal to co-invest with them to create a fund that would finance green technologies for the shipping industry. And of course, m my first question was, is there really a market for that? And listening to you, I'm thinking maybe there is, and we need to look at it more carefully. So IFC has been working actually at many different levels, starting with the policy level. So we came up with our own performance standards, so holding ourselves first to a higher standard than what was prevalent. 15 years ago, these were things that people did not ex accept as uh, good to do or necessary to do. The second was to really create an environment where other financiers like ourselves would buy in to upholding certain standards. And we did a lot of background work sharing our own performance standards, uh, at which became the basis for the equator principles, which today 72 commercial banks have signed up, including what's very exciting, our banks in Asia, in um, Latin America, and in other parts of the world not just in Europe and the United States. The second thing is that we realized in Asia in particular, <coughs> there seemed to be a reluctance to sign up for the equator principles. When we spoke to the banks in India, they said, we don't want to go with some foreign standard. We are going to come up with our own standards. And we tried to really engage and say, look, there is some merit to having a global standard because we are living in a global world and you're creating a level playing field across all financiers if you speak the same language. Today, I'm very proud to say that we have the first Equator Bank uh, signature in India and I think it's a trend that's starting to happen. In China, actually, we got support where we never expected to get it from the banking regulator. So the banking regulator actually came forward and said, please work with us to figure out a rational way of coming up with green banking regulations. And again, we are very happy and proud to say that that has really made inroads, not just in China, but now we have interest from Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam to see if they can adopt similar green banking standards. The third is really where we've been working with um, different sectors which are very important to countries. So in China, for example, the water waste and uh, particularly wastewater recycling is a sector that we've been very active in. And we took a conscious decision in China to focus on sectors that have a sustainability angle. And what's really amazing that we see is that in China, uh, there is really a whole industry of environmental services, solutions, technologies. Uh, IFC also created a special group that looks at venture capital type investments, and it's called our clean tech group. And they've invested, I would say, out of the 20 or so investments that we've done so far, about eight of them are in China. And they are different, uh, very interesting technologies for uh, wastewater recycling, uh, converting sludge into organic manure, um, um, use of IT platforms for efficiency improvement. One example I'd also like to share is in Bangladesh, where we started working with the textile industry uh, really on energy efficiency, because they, there's a real power shortage in uh, Bangladesh. And the idea was that by working on energy efficiency, we could help these businesses become more competitive. What we found was that actually there was an equal need to address water efficiency. And we've been working and getting amazing results across 
different types of uh, textile companies in Bangladesh. And what's really heartening to see is that once we sh could show tangible results of savings anywhere from 20 to 60 and 70 percent, both in energy and water usage, also in wastewater recycling, we have all the big global companies like H&M, Gap, Unilever, who've come forward to uh, literally give us money and say, uh, please involve us. We want to be involved in trying to help these standards um, in the textile industry. And coincidentally, China, having heard of the good results we've had in Bangladesh, has asked us now to start working in China with the textile industry in a similar fashion. So one of the things that IFC has tried to do is really do this type of knowledge sharing, whether it's on standard setting, policies, movements across sectors. And there seems to be a lot of interest if you can come up with a business model which makes sense. Last but not least, I would say, uh, again, for us, you know, looking at long-term sort of across generational uh, beneficial sectors and technologies has one which has motivated us to really focus uh, on long-term capital provision. So IFC was, I think, mm -hmm. among the first institutions to do, to issue global green bonds. And these bonds, the proceeds from these bonds can only be used for sustainable projects. And this has been actually a great trend because we find that not only are other uh, multilaterals <coughs> following suit, countries have started to issue green bonds as well. And the latest has been large corporates, especially among the extractive industry, the oil and gas industry, who have uh, taken up um, initiatives to start greening some of the most polluting industries. So I remain uh, very hopeful uh, of working with the private sector to really have a long-term impact in terms of improving the environment <coughs> as well as social standards across emerging markets. Thank you, Anita. Uh, now turning to um, Professor Chung. I, first, I'd like to thank you uh, for inviting me here. Uh, actually, uh, as a uh, public, uh, public said, in Chinese, in all the countries, there's a financial crisis, but in China, there's an environmental crisis. It's very serious. Right now, the, uh, in the city of Nanjing, all schools are closed because of the fortune issue. So this, uh, I, I think the, uh, the Chinese government right now uh, take this environmental problem as uh, serious. Uh, based on my uh, information, I think the, uh, the Chinese government right now, they are willing to pay say 2% of the GDP uh, to control the pollution issue. In the old days, the, uh, the on, on average, the GDP growth rate is, is 9%. Right now, the, the new government says 7% seven, 7 is okay. And uh, also from the uh, <coughs> from perspective, I, I'm talking this issue from two perspectives. One is from the private sector, other is from the, uh, East Asia. Uh, the, uh, the CCP just the initial uh, comprehensive reform plan. Uh, there's three uh, issues related to the allergy and, uh, and uh, pollution. And uh, we, if we want to identify uh, the policies effective, effectively, we need to think about the policies, uh, policy maker scale and their constraints. Right now, the Chinese government need to, uh, they're facing four challenges from based on my research. The first one is to keep economic growth at a 7% <coughs> rate. Second one is to fight income inequality. <coughs> we have a Gini coefficient uh, 0 0.6, which is very high. Third one is to deal with the business cycle. The, third one, the fourth one is about the pollution and the allergy issue. And uh, to, they cannot solve the four uh, goals. The, uh, so solve four problems at the same time without any uh, trade-offs. And in the, uh, in the reform plan, 
uh, there's three issues about the, uh, <coughs> this, the allergy issue and the pollution issue. Uh, from my perspective, I think the uh, pollution is a consequence. The key issue is, is the allergy. Uh, at the demand side, the Chinese government really show uh, like two taxes, new taxes are proposed and on their way to, to be effective. The first one is the environmental tax and uh, the, the second one is the energy tax. Uh, of course, uh, they want to reduce the tax burden for the uh, firms and the private sector. The maybe, there's maybe a tax called on the VHE, which is the major tax in China. Uh, at the uh, uh, supply side, the Chinese government uh, increased, significantly increased the, the standards uh, for the firms, for example, the, the gas, uh, the gasoline, the, standard, the, quantity, the standards of the gasoline, also the uh, trying to increase the supply of these uh, renewables, for example, the, uh, the solar and the wind. Also, this we're trying to, uh, to get the uh, less polluted uh, resource, for example, the gas. The, this is the reason the President Xi went to the uh, Central Asia. We, we, we have a deal with Russia. We have uh, uh, want to talk with the United States to get the uh, shale gas, to get shale gas. So I think these uh, policies or will be uh, able to <coughs> have some impact on the, the GDP growth, the composition, composition of the uh, GDP. Also, I think for uh, for the GDP growth, it's it's kind of uh, uncertainty, but it's good for the uh, composition of the GDP of the Chinese economy. The second one uh, issue is the major issue is about the environmental problem. It's good for the uh, pollution control. Also, it's good for the CO2 reduction. The, uh, the pollution control is good for the, not only for China, also for the rest of the Asia, East Asia. <coughs> uh, for the CO2 reduction, it's good for the future, for, the, for the, all the countries in the world. Uh, it's also, there's some uh, policy implications for international trade. I think because of the uh, consequence of this reform is that the higher price of Chinese goods and services, then the, uh, I think the in, in trade surplus will be smaller in the future because of the increase, increase the uh, price of the Chinese goods and services. And also, it's, uh, I think the natural resource, especially the gas, will be uh, having a bigger share in the annual trade of the, I mean, the China with other uh, trade partners. Uh, I, I think also it is uh, uh, from the perspective of the East Asia, uh, is we, we need, uh, my colleagues and I, we uh, propose a, a, a issue, say, uh, right now the East Asia for Japan and China has some, you know, dispute about the uh, small issue, I think. Uh, this is a big issue, but from my perspective, that's a small issue. The big issue is the energy and pollution. Uh, the pollution issue should be uh, solved in, in the whole, from the, I mean, the whole area. Also, uh, the energy supply and uh, the pollution control East Asia countries and regions have the same, in the same position, have the same common interest. Uh, I think we need to uh, work together to solve the, for the first one, to solve the problem. The first one, uh, to help China increase the energy efficiency. You know, China energy efficiency is very low. This is the good news for the for uh, private companies, also for the uh, Chinese people. I think that I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm happy to know that because if increase the energy efficiency increase, got increased, then the, uh, the pollution will be lower and the, G the damage on the GDP growth will be smaller. So this is good news. But the, compared with the South Korea and Japan, the Chinese e uh, energy efficiency is very, is very low. We can get some help from other countries and, uh, and especially the Japan and the uh, 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 other uh, countries. I think if they work together, we, we got the uh, East Asia Energy and Pollution Forum, something like that. We can discuss the uh, issue first. So we can mobilize the resource from the uh, Central Asia to build, to help the Central Asia countries to uh, uh, to get more uh, large resource, which is good for pollution control, also good for the energy security. Also, we can work together to, to ask the United States to uh, grant permissions but shale gas uh, export to East Asia. Also, you know, we uh, at the energy market, the energy uh, East Asia. There's a, a uh, the East Asia countries pay higher higher price 
we call that the East Asia, uh, uh, East Asia premium. premium. Uh, we can work together to reduce this kind of uh, risk premium. Also, we can uh, 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 issue, take a talk about the issue about the Middle East. If the United States got the early independent, they, they would not spend so much money on the uh, issue in Middle East. If something happened in Middle East, which will be a, a big problem for East Asia countries, is right? I think that's right. So, yeah, to uh, to sum up, I think the uh, first time the US, the Chinese government would take the environmental problem uh, uh, very seriously, but by uh, focus on energy issue, trying to make energy efficiency higher, then by uh, uh, increase the standards, by uh, uh, get more uh, uh, environmental friendly uh, uh, resource, also using taxes. I think this kind of issue will, uh, will have a negative, kind of negative impact on the GDP, uh, but it's good for the people's health, people's uh, health, people's regular life. And uh, uh, to solve this problem, uh, it's good for the, a lot of opportunities for the private sector. But the, uh, we need, uh, since the, this issue related to the other countries, these East Asia countries and regions need to be uh, working together to solve this problem. Uh, that's my point. Thank you. 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 没法说英语，嗯，我可能会会唱一点反调。其实所有的问题都归结一个问题，就是发展究竟是为了什么？啊，天天谈经济也好，国家谈 GDP， 像我们这样的论坛谈了很多经济，就最终就是我们的民众究竟能够得到多大的利益？啊，比方说物质消费能够实际上得到多少消费？比方说空气、食物和水。嗯，能不能够呃给我们带来更多的健康，减少更多的副作用 ？Um, I'm sorry, I have to speak in Chinese. Um, I'm really happy to be here. So, um, I am probably not the mainstream among the entrepreneurs in China, um, because um we have been talking a lot about the economy and finance um, and the development, but actually, um. How can people really benefit from um, this development? How then? How can they benefit in terms of material consumptions, and um, or the air quality, the water quality, and their real life? Are they happier than before? Zhao Jiao said, he talked about China's government's many new or proactive actions to improve the environment. Actually, my view is not completely like that. 呃，在中中国的过去十年时间，煤炭增加了四倍啊，石油增加了将近八倍消耗。嗯，如果说是我们的生活质量究竟增加了多少倍？嗯 ，Professor Chen just talk about a lot of um progressive measures Chinese government is taking to um manage the environment and control the pollution. But actually, uh, I wonder um. How much is this is really working? For example, um, the consumption of coal in China has um, multiplied by a factor of four in the last ten years, um, and the fossil fuels uh, multiplied by a factor of ten. Um, and actually, but what people's uh, life quality has increased? 那么，如果说是在国家战略里面有一个很重要的指标，就是。呃，我们的这个嗯，二氧化碳排放、污染物排放，应该是建立在什么的什么程度上面？不管经济是什么样的结果，我们的这样的环境的指标要要有一个指，要有一个这个高于一切的一个限度。我觉得这个限度的结果呢，肯定是最终也促进了我们的整个的经济的这个健康。I believe that um among the national strategies, we should have um. A standard for um, environmental um, quality, such as SOx, NOx, and greenhouse gases. 那我们公司是做这个工厂化的建筑啊，还有就是做这个大型的中央空调设备
。那在我们这里，我们自己的案例就很清晰。如果说我们的中央空调利用的这个发电厂的或者是发大型发电机的这个废热，它的效率就提高了一倍。那在西方国家，这种技术我们都在推广，我们在八十多个国家销售，在中国推广就非常的难。那大家看只看见今年和明年的问题，你后年的问题都看不见，它推广就比较难。And our enterprises is producing large scale and medium scale um ventilation, air conditioning and heating system, especially the non electric systems. Um. And we are selling our products to over 80 countries. Um, and we found that when we are using the waste heat um, to um, do the air, to power the air conditioning, um, the system becomes really uh, energy efficient. However, it is a little bit hard to spread this um, our products within China because people are focusing on their short-term gains and. They don't want to buy our products. 另一个问题呢，就是这个建筑。如果说这个建筑，尤其在中国的这个大多数地方，气候冬天极其冷，夏天极其炎热，建筑做好保温，这是个非常简单的事情。在欧洲现在已经，呃，简单每一个建筑的这个标准都是这样的，必须要达到的大概二十公分、三十公分的保温。在中国，或者做一点点，或者干脆就是不做保温。能源大概有百分之六七十，我想是超过百分之七十是白白的跑掉的，没有任何意义的。嗯、um, 嗯 ，Currently in Europe and United States, um, the there is a standard for um heat insulation, but actually in China there's no such standards. Um, more than um seventy percent of the heat are just um wasting. 刚刚说到煤炭为什么增加这么快？其实就是这个问题，就是这个，呃，建筑的大量的对于能源的消耗，不论是取暖啊、照明啊、空调啊，那么这个，嗯，如果说是有有一个起码的一个规范，在中国要能够推行一个起码的规范，可能能耗可以控制住，可能现在就已经达到峰值，接下来可以大幅度的下降的。香港也有这个问题啊，我们做这间房子，这个灯完全可以用荧光灯或者 LED 啊，用 LED 要减少十倍啊，啊，香港的这样的阳光都在外都在房子里头遮阳，其实如果在房子外面遮阳，那个效果就是很大幅度提高，提高两三倍的这个效率。So um the inefficiency in an architecture and construction is a reason why we use so much coal. So and the same thing happens in um Hong Kong. We should use more uh, natural lighting and as well as the LED light bulbs, so we can save a lot of energy. If we have a standard to improve um, the um, building codes um, in China, it will um, facilitate the technology um, progress. We in this new exploration field, we invested a lot of money. For example, solar and wind, for example, solar and wind, that is very bright, and very easy to produce a certain amount of energy. 越朴素的技术里面，几乎就没投什么钱。其实越朴素的时候，它往往越朴素的这些节能技术，成效是越突出的。Uh, no. Our country has spent a lot in the fancy looking and energy and technology such as solar and wind power, but actually we have much more areas to be explored that are not so fancy looking, but creates a bigger savings in the energy efficiency. 呃，时间不多啊，我再讲一个另外有建筑与建筑有关的例子，就是如果说在一个小的社区里面啊，能够步行到达的这么一个小范围里面，一平方公里、两平方公里、三平方公里这样的范围里面，呃，居住、办公、学校、呃，购物，如果都能够满足的话，这个城市对于交通的依赖就大幅度下降。嗯。Another thing I want to say um, is about a mixed-use and really dense community. Um, if we can build a dense community that has schools, hospitals, um, and working places, we um, we become less dependent on the transportation. 那么现在的情况是，呃，城市高速公呃这个高架路越来越多，地铁越来越多，轻轨越来越多，呃，然后我们在路上消耗的时间越来越长，空气也污染了。人也不幸福，每一天在路上一个小时、两个小时。现在有些城市都超过两个小时每一天
同情的事件。那其实没有一个地方受到了意义。其实本质上就是一个规划师的问题，就是一个城市的规划问题。Now in many cities in China, we are facing the status quo that like more roads are building, more highways are building, but the construct uh, congestion is not decreasing, and people becomes less happier than before because they have to um, bear the worse air quality and they spend longer time um, on commutation. Commutation, sorry. Now, this Western country, also, including Hong Kong, is very progressive. Because China is now becoming more and more industrialized. 如果这个快速的城市化中中间不吸取啊西方已经走过的一些这个分离式的社区的这种错误，如果不吸取的话，我们现在的这个问题会比西方更严重。啊，独立的开发区、工业区、教育区、这个居住区，现在这个问题比西方现有的问题还严重，比香港的问题还严重的多。香港算是全，如果跟中国大陆相比，香港算是最好最好的，距离最近的。And now, as China is facing the rapid urbanization, we got to learn from the lessons from industrialized countries. Um, we have to learn from um, um, the um, the bad consequences from a divided community that they separated living from shopping, from working. And now, um, actually, if we don't learn, we cannot do a development for the second time. And actually, Hong Kong is a good example in this term because Hong Kong is really dense and the public transport is really good. Hong um, uh, the problem with Hong Kong is that Hong Kong does not have much um, bicycle lanes. Um, in Berlin, um, every uh, one people has like one kilometer of bicycle lanes, but actually here, um, I hardly see any bicycle lanes, and the things are worse in China. Um, the key question in China is that we have to have national level legislations and the standard making to guide our developments. Um, and I think um, that's all I have to say. 我补充一句啊，这个帕米拉，他是在做这个企业社会责任啊，在做这个可持续发展方面的。我我看了他起起草的这个题目非常之好，所以我来参加这个会。啊，这个题目讲的非常之好，他说的是这个衡量发展和进步的标准是不是要变化？我觉得这个是最重要的。啊 ，GDP 完全不是一个标准，完全完全没有意义的。那一定要有个新的标准。Um, I um, come to this um, panel discussion because of um, Pamela's um, amazing questions, the issues we are going to discuss. And one of the questions is that should we change the measures of development or the criteria of successful development? Because I think GDP is not the real measure of development, at least not the only measure. So I really think we should change it. Okay, well that, that basically gives me a great introduction to ask my pet peeve question, which is that we all know that um, data and metrics drive behavior and they drive opinions. Okay, and we all know that uh, while we know that um, there's no, it's not a trade-off between economic growth and environmental sustainability, the way our global metrics are set up, it actually is. Okay, so what I would like to hear from the panel is, um, you know, there have been many attempts to revise GDP and to put more environmental um, and social metrics into GDP. All of these have come up with a lot of uh, great insights which have gone nowhere, basically. So uh, what, 
what should we do about this? Should we should we be looking to uh, get new metrics? Should we be looking at different sets, of different ways to evaluate our performance? It's all about what really does growth mean to us and what really does development mean? So that's the first question. The second question is that I just want to uh, uh, thank uh, Mr. Zhang for his comments. Um, and I really have to say, Mr. You know, Zhang, uh, Zhang, Bo, uh, uh, Zhang Zong, you sound like a closet politician because you have so many ideas on how to run the country. And meanwhile, Christine, you, you, you sound like you're trying to galvanize the private sector. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know, here we have someone in government who's talking about private sector action. We have someone in the private sector talking about government action, you know, and what are we going to do about this? Okay, so first, let's just go, uh, go around and say, uh, here are your views on metrics and GDP and, uh, and, 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 and are we using the right data? And then maybe we can get into the second question of how we incite more uh, more partnership, more collaboration. Thank you. So uh, we have many examples of uh, indices that have been created. I mean, uh, one could uh, look at uh, Bhutan, who has the gross national happiness. And although it brings a smile to everybody's face, uh, when you go to Bhutan and you really look at what they have managed to do, they have a whole ministry that looks into this measurement, and it's not uh, a frivolous measure. So I think that uh, in, in some ways, instead of reinventing the wheel, one could really take, make that a starting platform. Uh, the second is the UN has come up with the Human Development Index, uh, which hardly gets referred to. So. I think it's also changing the language because GDP is the language that, and, and maybe multilaterals like ourselves, the IMF, that's where we can make a start. Um, and, and I fully agree with you that, that what's uh, measured usually motivates and incentivizes to get things done. And what we have been trying to do as an institution is also a little bit of naming, and I wouldn't say shaming, but more faming. So talking about best practice, good examples. And as I mentioned from the Bangladesh experience, I really think there's a hunger uh, from at least the private sector to come up with something which where they can hang their sustainability hats and say, yes, we are for this, we are behind this. So uh, for all of us as, as thinkers and, and private sector and government policy makers, I do think there is a, a vacuum in terms of coming up with a measure that will motivate us towards being more sustainable. Well, uh, I certainly personally agree that uh, if there was, uh, alongside the GDP uh, measurements, that there are others that we can look at. Uh, I entirely agree that let's go where somebody has already started serious homework, and let us not all reinvent the wheel. And let us not forget that um, China, the Chinese government, has tried to put in place a green GDP and other people have, have looked at it, and China has acknowledged that, uh, yes, uh, um, the loss to traditional GDP from environmental degradation could be anywhere between 2 and 5%, uh, which is uh, very, very significant. So, now, I mean, as a, uh, a government official in the Hong Kong government, I, I can say we're doing no work in this area. But, you know, that is not to say, let's beat ourselves up and we're bad. Um, because otherwise, all governments should be beating themselves up. But, you know, I think the uh, intellectual acceptance that GDP is, is just not a, an enough of an indicator of what life is about. I, I think we all accept this. Yeah? Secondly is how to create something that is credible. I, I suspect something will probably come in the next 10 years, because people are now beginning to work seriously on it. Now, the kind of indices that are beginning to have a little bit of traction are things like um, well, measuring pollution. pollution. Uh, we, we're now being a bit smarter about the pollution. We're now linking it to uh, public health. Um, 
And I've talked to uh, colleagues on the mainland, and they say, well, that's where we need to go next, because, I mean, obviously, the health impact coming from the level of uh, pollution today in China is just off the chart. Now, we know this, but exactly how bad, I mean, there's a, a lot of work to be done. And I think when we're talking about livability, quality of life, uh, development, what it really means, I think these kinds of, uh, of uh, concepts and arguments and data uh, and political discussions will come to the fore more and more. So in a way, because politicians serve only a very short time, um, uh, I, I personally uh, am looking for where are the areas where in the next few years we can make the biggest change. So as I said, I think the intellectual debate, I'm very interested to participate in it, but I don't think in Hong Kong we have the cap capability or the capacity to work it all out, so we'll not be a leader in that area. But there are areas in Hong Kong where if we added our voice, if we got our companies to do more carbon audits and you know, energy uh, audits and so on, we're able to start a discussion about where we ought to go. Now, it may sound just very, very simplistic and, you know, uh, very 101, but the truth is, we're not beyond the 101. Many places, including Hong Kong, we're still at the 101. So that's why I think, uh, I mean, I've seen no other example, except from the Fairwinds Charter, where the industry has taken a clear leadership position, gone to the government and said, we're gonna do it. And we want you to legislate to create a new, higher level playing field, where the government said, are you serious? And they said, yes, we're serious, we can show you, and in two years you change the law. I mean, that, that is quite something. That is quite something, and that's why I keep going around, I keep asking, are there other areas like this, where at least in, in this city, where you and I can control a little bit of something, is there another fair wind charter that we can put in place? I will make two points. Uh, I, I agree with uh, you guys. I think as the uh, professional, uh, you know, I'm a, a professor of economics. We we know very well the shortcomings of the GDP. This concept, you know, we know that. For example, in China, we produce some pollution with GDP. Uh, with the uh, you know, with treatment, that's GDP, double GDP, but for nothing. For hurt, actually, we know that right. So uh, uh, in the real world, I to measure the performance of our country of our region, we use a, a bunch of indicators. I think in real life, GDP is less important. For example, the unemployment rate, the government pays more attention on that, right? For example, for the pollution uh, indicators, in each and every advanced countries, the firms, uh, household pay more attention and firms, this is very important uh, uh, burden or, or restrictions regulations, legal burdens for firms, right? Uh, GDP is, is nothing. I think in China, because of the, uh, uh, the professionals, they don't care about that. The, the, the media pay attention on GDP. In the real life, GDP is not so important. I, 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 that's my two points I want to make. Thank you. And um, here I have a paper um, about um, a indicator about the low carbon um, indicator. It's called the Alashan um, low carbon indicator. Okay. Um, I believe there should be um, indicators and standards for on the national level, the local level, for industry and also for agriculture. And every sector should have its own standard. Also, we got to um, measure um, the quality of our education, life, um, social welfare. Um, so we should um, conclude that when each 
an indicator has reached to some point, we our life quality is good. 那如果说设定了这样的指标以后，这个一个国家跟国家之间，城市跟城市之间，甚至于个人之间，呃，幸福指数或者叫这个成功或者叫进步的指数，就能够反就能够反映出来，啊、呃，不完全是幸福指数，看是一个什么样的指标，是完全可以通过三四个指标。So now we can compare between nation and nation and city and um, between city and city um, in terms of a basket of indicators. 那么呃，曾经有一个恩格尔系数，它反映了一定程度上反映了一个人的这个富裕程度。There used to be a um indicator called the Engel coefficient. It used to uh, reflect Um, a people's um, richness. 我认为呢，这个食物的健康，这个用衣的这个量的减少，其实是完全可以反映出一个人的这个这个幸福的程度的。现在我们的食物、我们的空气、我们的水的毒害太大。Now I I believe that um the food quality um and um the reliance on medical service. Could reflect a quality of one's life. 德国它的这个嗯，现在的有机食品的这个比例是百分之三十，全欧洲最高的一个大国。那它还有更高的标准，好像是二零三零年要达到百分之一百。其实这就是最重要的一个建一个一个一个幸福指标，因为所有围绕着有机食品的所有的这个观念，到到生业生产行为都改变了，生产行为、商业行为都改变了。Now Germany and um, produces thirty percent of organic food of all the food it consumes, and I believe that is a uh, indicator of the food quality. And because it incorporates um, the, a, a, a change in concept from production to consumption. 香港至少可以来尝试啊！香港这个地方人的素质比较高，地皮比较小，可以来尝试通过一定的民。民众的这个研调研可以设定出这个幸福指标或者叫进步指标。我觉得香港是完全可以在亚洲、在中国做一个做一个表率。有了这样一个指标以后，其他的问题就都会好解决。现在是没有指标，本质的问题，所有的问题的根本就是没有指标。嗯 ，Hong Kong might have a try too because Hong Kong is relatively small and Hong Kong people are more aware of this. Probably, if there is a standard setting for the food quality, it could be um, it could be it's spread to China. So we all have a standard, um, and we we have a direction to move to. And I believe the lack of standard and indicator is the worst problem of all. Okay, so uh, thank you. Um, so I, I, I gather that uh, we need to begin looking at development and growth with a, um, a, a basket of metrics where, uh, which, where, we, where we actually have more nuance and which more accurately reflect quality of life and quality of development. That means, of course, that we need actually greater awareness in society and the lack of reversion to something very brutal and simple. Um, which is brutal in its simplicity, uh, such as GDP, which means we need more awareness, we need more education, um, because even if we get everything in policy and business right, if we don't bring along the people, actually, um, you know, it, it won't have a lot of effect. So uh, with that, um, we're going to end around uh, 4.10, which is in a couple of minutes. Um, I would like to actually hear uh, from, uh, from you. And, in contrast to many conferences where people say, we only want to hear your question. We don't want to hear your comment. Actually, we do want to hear your comment. So I would ask for your comment, and please uh, just be brief uh, and be concise in it. So please. I know there's a lot of experts in the room, so you know, here's your chance. Voice out. Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Bill Flans. Uh, I'm not an expert, but I do live in Hong Kong and I live in the world and I, I breathe the air and uh, I hate to say it but it's appropriate that we have these cloudy looking translucent shades drawn because that's the view we so often have when we look out the window. Um, and, and with that as a preface, I, I just want to mainly thank uh, Christine for the leadership she has shown with Civic Exchange and now to take on the 
burden of trying to work within the Hong Kong government to make it make an impact. You've done so much for the environment here, and uh, I think you've really shown the leadership that we need. I would just say, you know, one comment I would make is it seems to me that um, if we can get the price of electricity high enough, and if we can get the price of polluting coal high enough, and if we can get the price, I think in my own working life, I've seen the price of oil go from $3 to $9 to $30 to $100 a barrel. And now the airlines are paying out something like 40% of their revenue for fuel. Uh, to talk about giving them an additional tax to fly into Europe seems, you know, unnecessary. In, in contrast, out here in Asia, we have uh, the landlords set the temperature in the shopping malls, and then they pass the cost of the air conditioning off on their tenants. So the people who control the, the, the switches don't bear the cost. And it's no wonder, and then the government doesn't enforce any temperature regulation, so it's no wonder that when you go when you go outside in Hong Kong, you have to take your clothes off. When you go inside, you need a sweater. Anyone else? Uh, Annie? Hi. Um, I think I would be doing uh, Hong Kong a service if I, I didn't mention this. Um, uh, Chairman Zhang mentioned uh, the desirability of having uh, some kind of index uh, that uh, measures um, uh, other things than um, economic performance. Um, and again, uh, uh, I have to certainly give credit to, to Christine. Uh, during her time at Civic Exchange, um, uh, we are in fact um, at Civic Exchange working on precisely such an index, um, dealing, covering Asian cities, um, trying to measure well-being um, as imperfect as it is going to be, but it does take into account um, things that are important, like food, um, like transportation, like security, like access um, to uh, um, uh, healthcare and uh, transportation. So all of those things. Um, it's still under development, um, early stages yet. Um, we would very much welcome other participants uh, to, to join this project because um, uh, it's not enough to uh, just have one for uh, Hong Kong. I think to make it meaningful, I think um, uh, we need to have uh, that index applied to a number of uh, other um, Asian cities, including cities in, in China. Um, and this is going to be a, a very significant undertaking that um, requires a lot of resources. So if I can make a plug for that. <laughs> so. Um Hi, um, this is actually a question. I don't have a comment. And it directly refers to Danita, but I wouldn't mind if the other panel members also took a shot at it. We're, I guess we're all trying to build a world where there's more sustainability. Um, as you probably know, in August, India became the first country in the world to mandate uh, compulsory uh, CSR 2% uh, taxes put in. I'd like to get the panel's opinion about the effectiveness of that kind of a measure. Thank you. I just to, uh, I guess, underscore what Bill said uh, and Annie. Um, we have these great indices, and I think they're fantastic. But you know, most of us are pretty simple people, and I think prices, you know, GDP, we can focus on prices. We can focus on, and we're not paying the right price for water, let alone for carbon and all the externalities. I mean, it's hard to do. But you know, if we're really paying the true price for coal and what it's doing to the health of Chinese people, people would change their behavior because coal would be priced differently. Okay, all right, while you're there. Uh, Marco from Tokyo. Um, very similar comment to uh, the other gentleman, but uh, talking about this index, uh, wondering whether uh, CSR, which is a uh, Corporate uh, Social Responsibility Index, which is very much uh, important in evaluating uh, companies' value these days, not just financial analysis, but the CSR index is very much important. So you could think about this kind of index uh, together with uh, uh, together with other key uh, figures of the country. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, hi, professors, and I want to ask a question. And I think we, uh, what we talk about is about uh, rich uh, developed areas in China, like Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, or Beijing. But in my opinion, uh, I think village uh, or poor areas in China is more polluted than rich areas. And uh, I think why they are more polluted is that uh, polluted factories uh, remove from rich areas to uh, to poor areas, and uh, the uh, officers in poor areas want to uh, make them uh, make more achievement. Uh, and uh, one officer I know said just said that in a village, he says I know the factory is very very polluted, but it uh, it can make a lot of profits. So we will build them. So I want to know how to solve these problems in village or in poor areas. I think it's much uh, difficult because they have no money. Okay. Let's hear the question uh, or the comment from Michael and then we'll go back okay. to the panel. I have just two brief questions. One for Ms. Okay. George about the green bonds, uh, both in the, the IMF and uh, corporate bonds. Uh, how do these work? Uh, do they, is, are they just like any other bond except that there's something written in it saying that these will only be used for green projects, and how do you define green projects? And the, uh, the other question is for uh, Mr. Zhang. Uh, um, what do you use to convert the waste heat to, uh, what technology converts the waste heat so that you can use it to power the air conditioning? Is it low temperature turbine, or what, what, what is it? OK, so Anita, do you want to take? Okay, so uh, I think there were two questions, and maybe I'll start uh, by answering Michael's. It's, it's really very simple and straightforward. The green <coughs> bonds are like any other bonds. It's the use of proceeds that have to be for green projects, and they are quite well defined. It's part of the prospectus, and investors come forward on the basis of how those funds are used. And many of the investors themselves have for various reasons, including CSR type reasons, have uh, made a commitment to put a certain percentage of their investments in green investments. Mm -hmm. So we see this as a way both of mobilizing more funds for green investments, as well as making it very explicit that <coughs> the eligibility for such funds will be by projects which are sustainable. But if it's a corporate bond, whether they get paid, whether the bond pays, it's just a function of the, yes, the whole company. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's issued by IFC, which is a AAA global institution. Yeah. So we are the issuer of the bond. Mm -hmm. It's really how we use those proceeds. And for the investors who are buying those bonds, it's that they can claim that they have contributed towards green projects. Uh, just to answer the corporate social responsibility, I mean, I think it's a good thing, but I, did, I don't think it really answers the sustainability question because for us, when we look at any company, it's what's the footprint that they leave, both from an environmental and social side, and, and we would rather mainstream that than make it just a side activity that you do to feel good from time to time. I, the, I'd just like to respond to the issue of uh, the divided interest in building management. Uh, the, um, I'm not copping out to say, you know, government should regulate better. I mean, that actually is the, is the end point. Um, but for government to regulate in an area where it's quite complicated, usually it takes a long time, even if they say, I want to start it today. So my suggestion to say that if there are a number of developers and building managers out there who believe in this, who believe there's also an economic case for them to do this, and are willing to band together and do it, and then tell the government, this is what you ought to do, and rally the industry to come along like the Fairwinds Charter, that is a very powerful you know, experiment. Taking it then to government to say, we've virtually worked it out for you. you know, then, in a way, you're, you're not wasting time to get politicians to focus on something that they don't necessarily are able to work out completely in any case. 
Because if the government were first to say, well, we, we want to think about doing this, and then going to the industry, and then starting to say, well, how about you, try, you know, how about you, and how about you? Another way is for them to put up their hand and say, right, we're ready to go, but this is good for our business. We believe in this. Do it. Government will now come along today. It won't, they won't stand on side and say, I don't want to know. So that we can just, I mean, I think what we're interested in is how you can cut down on the time when you can make new policies. And when you have the industry support, usually it goes through the legislature. It's when everybody is still fighting. And then, of course, you really need the details from the industry, in any case, to work out the legislation. Okay. Uh, I'm I... <laughs> 一个建筑里面其实是有两股废热可以利用的叫叫CHP的这个模式呢就是把电把它分散掉 自冷需要技术比较专业一些，大概就嗯有九十五度以上的所有的热量都可以利用。也就是说，它如果排放出来百分之六十的热量，里面的百分之五十我们是可以利用的，就是这个意思。这是一股，另外一股热量就是这个房
got a bigger problem because nobody wants to say that. Mm -hmm. He said the, the African is poor because of the pollution is low. Then the environmental people hate him very much. So I, I, I would not say that in you know, public because this is the CEOs, I can say that. The, uh, move, uh, the pollution industry move from Hong Kong, from Shenzhen to the other areas is better off, make local people, people better off. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we covered, wow, well, we covered business action, we covered policy, we covered standards, covered behavior, covered metrics. Um, I think the general message is that um, basically this is a huge shift that we're trying to make. And basically we have to try everything, which means that everyone has to do something. So I leave you with that message. There is uh, coffee, tea, and snacks outside and on the fourth floor. Um, and then uh, please fill out um, the questionnaire on your seats. Um, and thank you. Next session begins uh, probably at, it's supposed to be at 4.30, but I have a feeling they're going to run slightly late. So thank you very much. Please give a hand to the panel.